If you have your Bibles, would you turn to Acts chapter 18, beginning in verse 1, Acts chapter 18. I see Dr. Mayo out there. He'd served a number of years, professor of math and professor of uh, some science courses there. I know he taught physics. Uh, I think out of all the senior math majors, I was the only one that ended up going into ministry. A lot of people say, why did you study that? Uh, I studied it because I enjoyed math. Uh, but while I was at Hampton, Sydney, God called me into the ministry, but uh, have so many fond, fond memories. Acts chapter 18 and verse 1, I'm going to begin reading there in just a moment. But you know, one of the more paradoxical accounts in all of the Bible centered around a significant Old Testament figure, Elijah. You may remember Elijah was a powerful prophet of God that he did some amazing things. And one of the more amazing things that uh, God used Elijah to do happened at a place called Mount Carmel. And while he was on that mountain, he challenged 450 prophets of Baal and he proved God. God was the one who did it. And he did it through the hands and through the ministry of Elijah. You may remember that Elijah taunted those prophets and as their false God, Baal could not perform. And you may remember too that uh, Elijah had water, uh, jugs and jugs of water poured on the altar to make it as difficult as could be. And God still called down fire. And what an amazing Old Testament miracle it was. In fact, one of the great miracles in all of the Bible as the people uh, looked at Elijah and then began to focus on the true God. And they said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. You would think that Elijah having accomplished all this and seeing what God did would have taken a victory lap, but you would be wrong. Enter a woman named Jezebel, and not just any woman, but a very wicked ruler. And Jezebel was threatened by Elijah, and so she threatened Elijah and said, By this time tomorrow, you will be done. And suddenly this man who stood against 450 prophets of the false god was fleeing for his life. And when he fled, he fled under a juniper tree and he sat down and he wished he would die. And the point I want to bring out this morning is this. Elijah, as powerful as he was, was still a person and he was lonely. God corrected him though. He said, I have 7,000 just like you. And so God was giving Elijah perspective. But in that moment, Elijah felt very lonely. You know, loneliness is one of the most devastating things that a person can experience. Do you realize there are a lot of things that you and I can experience that are a lot easier than loneliness, but over 40% of us will be affected personally by loneliness sometime in his or her life. Chronic illness increases, or chronic loneliness rather, increases um, the acceleration of death by 14%. Loneliness causes blood pressure and cholesterol to increase. And interestingly, I read that loneliness can literally make someone feel cold. So socially, psychologically, emotionally, spiritually, physically, loneliness can be a devastating thing. But I want you to know today that God does not desire that we be alone. God himself is with us, but also he has provided brothers and sisters in Christ to stand with us. And today we see that Paul is moving to a new city of Corinth. And we're going to see that he is in a new city, but the challenges are the same that we have seen over the past few weeks in towns and cities that he has visited. Yet we see a unique promise that God gave him. And it was this, I have a lot of people, Paul, in this city, and you're going to be okay. In other words, what he was saying is you're not alone. Look with me at Acts chapter 18, verses 1 through 11. It said, after this, 
He left Athens and went to Corinth, where he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Paul came to them, and since they were of the same occupation, tent makers by trade, he stayed with them and worked. He reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade both Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself to preaching the word and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Messiah. When they resisted and blasphemed, he shook out his clothes and told them, your blood is on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. So he left there and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God whose house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord, along with his whole household. Whole household. Many of the Corinthians, when they heard, believed and were baptized. The Lord said to Paul in a night vision, Do not be afraid, but keep speaking, and do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one will lay a hand on you to hurt you, because I have many people in this city. He stayed there a year and a half teaching the word of God among them. Let's pray. Father, as we look to your word today, uh, we thank you, Lord, for what we're going to learn about the importance today of fellowship. How, Lord, every Christian is dependent on other believers. We need the strength. We need the counsel. We need the protection. All of that comes, Lord, from being in fellowship. And so, Lord, while our faith is certainly an individual faith where each individual needs to personally come to know you, Lord, it is also important that we join together with brothers and sisters, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. We've already been through Paul's first missionary journey, and we are moving toward the culmination of his second journey here in Corinth. Paul is at Corinth, and we see that he stays there for one and a half years. That's longer than any that we see to this particular point. And as we think about the city of Corinth, this is a new city that we're studying. There are a few things of note. It was the capital city of Achaia, a Greek province. It was the home to many wealthy people. Also, the city of Corinth was located on an isthmus. And what that basically meant was it was a very strategic place for trade. As many people wanting to avoid a circuitous route south and around would take this narrow strip of land, ships would come on one side, say to the west, the goods would be transported just a few miles across to the east where other ships would pick up that cargo and move it. And so it was a place that was very, very busy. Again, a place where there was a lot of wealth, a lot of action. We had just studied about Athens. Athens, that was an intellectual center. We might say that Corinth was a commercial center. But there was another thing about Corinth that was not very good. It was a morally depraved city. In fact, it worshipped uh, the goddess Venus, the Roman goddess of love and sex. And so there was much prostitution. There were a lot of illicit sexual things that were going on in the city of Corinth. In fact, there was a term that was used to speak speak of such immorality in that day, and it was the term to Corinthianize. And so while the rich may have made you think you were on Wall Street, uh, the morally depraved would make you think you were on Bourbon Street, and it was a typical secular city. And so we see that Paul has entered this city, and it again was going to be a challenge. But I want you to note that wherever Paul was, he had people around him, and not just people. He had fellow Christians. Just a brief review, and this is just a few instances where we see that fellowship was important to Paul. First, when he was cast out of Berea, you remember the city he was in earlier, it was important to Paul that Paul, uh, Silas, and Timothy join him. Luke, who wrote Acts in the we section, includes the truth that he himself was with Paul during his journeys. The jailer whose, uh, whose life was saved, both spiritually and physically, opened up 
his house that Paul would fellowship with him. And not just that, but Lydia hosted him in Philippi. And going back to Berea, when he was chased out of Berea, was the brothers and sisters in Christ who helped him escape. And when in Lystra, it tells us that the disciples gathered around him. In other words, Paul centered his life around Jesus Christ, but that life that was centered around Jesus Christ had revolving around him also the lives of other believers. Are you convinced today that you need the fellowship of fellow Christians? I hope that you are. But I want to see th uh, mainly, mainly two main things today regarding the fellowship of uh, believers. And we're going to look at how important this was in Corinth. First, I want you to note the hospitality of Aquila and Priscilla and then Titius Justice. In fact, in this city where God was going to protect him, we see that first he came into the home of other believers. But then we're going to see this promise from God that God had many people there. Now, as we look at uh, Aquila and Priscilla's hospitality, as we look at the hospitality of Titius Justice, ha have you noticed how many times Paul sat down at the table with people, how many times he stayed overnight with people? Hospitality is a beautiful thing in the Christian faith, people opening their homes. I was blessed growing up in a home where my parents were hospitable. In fact, it was a frequent thing for young people people to be in our house that my mom and dad were mentoring in the church or other things like that. And I personally benefited from parents who were hospitable, who had their homes open. And Paul could feel the love of fellow Christians as they opened their homes. It is a sharing of life. But I want you to see a second thing, that God made a promise. And he said here in verses 9 and 10 in this dream, Paul, you're not alone. I have many people in this city. Just as he told Elijah, I have 7,000 just like you of which you're not aware. God made Paul aware that there were many people. And, and I want you to note, this is not a promise for everyone. Some people will read this and they'll go off on a mission excursion and they'll think God has many people in that place. No, this is a descriptive part of scripture, not a prescriptive. By that, I mean, it describes a promise that gave God gave to Paul, not a comprehensive promise that is for everyone. In fact, there are many missionaries today who are serving faithfully in countries where there are very few Christians. But the point is this, and we need to note it. Paul had a need and God provided for that need by sending fellow Christians. You know, we need fellowship. John Donne, the 17th century English poet, famously said, no man is an island. And what that means is this, none of us lives unto him or herself alone. We need each other. In fact, we need fellowship. No Christian is to live his or her life alone. Christian fellowship for me has been one of the greatest blessings in all of my life. I would rather be around brothers and sisters in Christ and fellowship, enjoying that fellowship than most anything in the world. Paul needed it. Paul needed brothers and sisters in Christ if he were to stay in Corinth. And so Paul provided Silas and Timothy came. We see that the homes were open, these three individuals, and that God had promised uh, many, many people would be around him. Now I want to look at four benefits of fellowship in the Christian life. We see that God promised it. God provided it through Aquila and Priscilla and Titius Justice, uh, that God sent Silas and Timothy to be there with him. And so I want to move from what we see that happened in Paul's life to four truths uh, that we can grasp today regarding Christian fellowship. The first three we'll directly see that apply to Paul, and the fourth we can most certainly believe Paul experienced. And the first thing is this, Christian fellowship encourages us. Christian fellowship encourages us. Why did Elijah feel so despondent? Well, in part, because he was alone. For those of you who have been around here for a while, you've heard me share this personal testimony, but I want to share it again because it's a very 
uh, appropriate for this particular point, how fellowship encourages. A number of years ago, in fact, the first year I was at Concord, we had a self-proclaimed prophet in our community. Some of you who were here 30 years ago may remember. And it was a very difficult season for me. The deacons were wonderful and provided great leadership for this young 26-year-old pastor, but it was a problem. We later found out that this man a few months later would have a standoff with a number of AT agents at his house. So needless, it was a tenuous time. In fact, uh, everybody who's been here a while used to laugh and say, you see that frame around um, the stained glass behind me? They said I was as white as that frame uh, when I stood up because he was going to try to usurp the pulpit. Well, we had a plan and, and we tried to execute that plan, but this man really was irrepressible. God took care of the situation, but uh, let's just put it this way. It was an experience from which we all learned that we never want to experience again. But around when that was happening and what was happening, I would receive phone calls, sometimes an hour, hour and a half long, trying to go through a discourse of what they were going to do. I was trying to deflect this person from trying to stand up in front of the group. And it was very, very stressful for me, a young preacher. We had an older deacon, his sons are here today, Mike and David Johnson. Clyde Johnson was, was his name. Now Clyde was one of the toughest men in our church. In fact, I was glad that he was the last in the handshake line after church because he had a vice grip handshake. If he were at the beginning, my hand would have been numb. Uh, he was a mechanic, he was a man of God, worked hard all his life. And so I'm sitting at the house one evening, it was the middle of the week, around Valentine's Day. And there's a knock at the door and there is Clyde. And he, here's this man's man and he's standing with a coffee mug in his hand full of Valentine's candy. Well, the first thing I say is, Clyde, I'm going to go back and get Karen. And he stood perfectly still. He said, it's not for Karen, it's for you. <laughs> That has still been a blessing to me because here was somebody who says, I'm with you. I'm coming alongside a simple gesture. And what that tells us is this, the fellowship encourages us. We need the encouragement that fellowship can bring. Now, Paul had been through a lot of difficulty to this point. It seems like everywhere we have seen Paul in the last few months that he's found himself in an area of difficulty. But I want you to know that here in Corinth, he wasn't alone. Now, it's very important for us to understand that one reason Paul was able to stay a year and a half was because of this fellowship. He needed it. Have you noticed a lot of the other areas, and again, it was God's will that he moved from city to city, and sometimes the adversity he faced would drive him to another city, and that was part of God's will. But God wanted him to stay in Corinth. And, and since he would stay in Corinth, he knew that he needed others around him. Paul wasn't alone, and he received encouragement of knowing he was not alone. Do you know why it's so important that we get involved in small group fellowship? It's great to be involved in larger groups, but when we see each other face to face and we have that encouragement and, and we're able to see somebody and look and they say, how are you doing? How's it going? And we can really get involved in each other's lives. There's a great encouragement in it. But I want you to see a second thing. Fellowship emboldens us. It doesn't only encourage us when we go through difficulty, but it emboldens us. There is strength in numbers. If you've noticed, Paul faced adversity everywhere he went, and he would move area to area. But where he got his strength was where there were other Christians. You know, my father was a teetotaler. 
Um, I never knew my father ever to even take a drink, and he had very little patience with people in a drunken state. It was just, it irritated him. I knew that from when I was very young. Uh, one time he was at an event with my brother-in-law, and there were people, my dad was 65 at the time, and there were people in their 20, the 20s that were in a drunken state and were being really obnoxious, and my dad just told him, be quiet, quit it. And then he stood behind my brother-in-law who was six foot five, 245 pounds. <laughs> my dad felt emboldened because he had a big boy and he was a big boy beside him. You know, the fellowship of believers emboldens us. There's strength in fellowship. In Matthew chapter 18, Jesus said, wherever two or three are gathered, you can be sure that my presence is there. Re remember back in Sodom and Gomorrah, remember if, if, if there could be 45 righteous men there, God would spare the city. And what, what, what was he finding out? He was finding out, Moses was, he was finding out that there was protection. There was protection. Abraham was in numbers. There was protection in numbers. There was strength in the fellowship. But I want you to see a third truth. Not only does it uh, encourage us, the fellowship, not only does it embolden us, but it motivates us to right action. The fellowship of the church should encourage us toward right action. There's a man named James Clear. I mentioned his book last week that I'm reading called Atomic Habits. And he mentions in his book a study done by a psychologist, Solomon Ash, in the 1950s. And in Ash's experience, he would have various individual persons enter a room with a number of people they did not previously know in that room with them. And the other persons were actors, and they were told at the beginning to make a decision that is intentionally or was intentionally wrong. And so in this experiment, there were two pages. On one page, there would be one line that was drawn, a vertical line. On the other page, there would be three lines. One would be the exact length of the one on the original page. The other two would be different lengths. And so the actors were told at the beginning and the whole group was going to confer at the end of this event to intentionally choose not only the wrong line, but the line that was the most different from the original line. And so here's this one person in the room with these other people who have conspired to choose the wrong line. And the one person knowing they've got to be wrong, but Solomon Ash realized that 75% of the time, the individual would choose the same line as the actors, even though he or she knew it was wrong. You know what they call, we call that today? Peer pressure. Peer pressure. And we think about peer pressure and how it has such a negative, negative influence. But I want to tell you that it also can have a positive influence. We often warn our children, be careful of the company that you keep. We're so involved with our children and our teenagers making sure that their friends share the right values. We don't want our children to be led down the wrong path by people who would uh, more than desire to do so. But hanging with the right people can lead to right actions. I've shared my mom used to always invite friends to our house. And I've told a number of people, she said, first, I want to know your friends. And second, I want them to know me. I want them when, when they're out on a Friday night and if they're tempted to lead you, I want them to know my face. And I thought there was a lot of wisdom in that. But do you realize that when we are in the fellowship of the church, it's a blessed thing. It exhorts us. Paul was able to keep on he was energized. Have you ever been discouraged? And then you get around a group of Christians that are, are there and, and all of a sudden you're motivated again to right actions. One of the benefits of Christian fellowship is we share the same goals of Christ likeness 
and it leads us toward righteousness. But the fourth thing, and I don't see that necessarily here. The first three, Paul kept on with the right action. Paul was encouraged. Paul was emboldened. But I most certainly believe this. It brings joy. Christian fellowship brings joy. There was a reason he stayed in these homes. There was a need. But I can just picture Paul in these homes and they're sitting and they're talking about the Lord and they're talking about everything and there's a joy in the experience. Why do you think Paul, when he would leave areas, if he left uh, Silas and Timothy behind, would say, please join me quickly. I believe in part because there was a joy in the Christian fellowship. That doesn't mean there was always a happiness because happiness and joy are two different things, but there was a great fellowship. I, I wonder if as I was reading this, I wonder what he did in the homes of these people, uh, of Lydia and Titius Justice and Aquila and Priscilla, as they sat down probably around food and began to talk about all that the Lord was doing. I know there was joy in the fellowship, and I believe that joy kept him going. A few years ago, I was part of a mission team from this church that went to Bennington, Vermont, to uh, Northeastern Baptist College. What a great experience it was. And while we were there, we visited a restaurant in that area. And the waitress came by and said, are y'all with the group from Northeastern Baptist College? And, and we agreed. And she said, you know, I love y'all's groups. I think the others must have tipped pretty well, you know. <laughs> but she said, there's something different about these groups of Christians who are coming here. There's a laughter, there's a joy, there's, there's an exuberance, there's, there's something that we don't often see here. You know what that was? Christ, Christ. He brings a joy. And that fellowship is not based on the color of skin or the age. It's not based on socioeconomic standing. It is based on one common thing, the Lord Jesus Christ. One of the most blessed experiences, and I know some of y'all, Mike, Danny, a number, Paul, y'all have been on the foreign mission field of people from an entirely different culture. You can't even speak the same language they speak, but there's a bond that is unspoken. There's a joy. There's a fellowship that comes, and we need it. We need it. Why did Paul provide, or why did God provide Paul with this fellowship? Well, first, he cared about Paul. But I believe, secondly, he knew that he needed Paul there 18 months. And that if Paul were to stay there 18 months, he couldn't do that ministry in isolation. If you notice how when he went to Corinth, he went to two different homes. We don't see that in these other areas, but it was so important to God that Paul realized the importance of fellowship so Paul could do the work. And that's paramount. That's paramount. We've been talking about the personal benefits of fellowship, and it does encourage us. It does embolden us. It does lead us to experience that joy. But it also enables us to be everything God would have us to be. Their kingdom benefits to the fellowship. It's about the kingdom. We can do more together than we can do alone. You know, often we go to the doctor for a prescription and we say, doctor, I need help. And we're ready for him or for her to write out what we need. But God's word gives us a ready prescription today. And it's this, the fellowship of other believers. It, it, it helps in so many areas. And God doesn't want us to be alone, just as he gave that promise to Paul. While we may not claim specifically in a particular city that we would have it, we know that God surrounds us with people to encourage us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this beautiful gift of the fellowship of the local church. Lord, your word tells us in Hebrews 10 that we're to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as some are in the habit of doing, but that we are to come together, Lord, in fellowship.
Father, I pray today as we come to this time of decision that you would stir our hearts, that, Father, we might be mobilized to seek that individual or that group or whatever that you would call us to do, that we might find strength in numbers of the fellowship of brothers and sisters in Christ. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to have a song in just a moment. I don't know how God has spoken to you, but as I was studying this, I'm reminded how we need each other. It may be that God is stirring your heart to be involved in a small group or to start a small group, to encourage, to, to exhort others, to embolden others. It may be today that you need to receive the fellowship or it may be today that you may be on the end of extending the fellowship. God may place someone on your heart and say, you know, you really need to reach out to this brother, to this sister, to encourage them, surround them with the love. We have so many opportunities in this church. Uh, Sunday school is a wonderful opportunity. We, we have ladies Bible study. They would love to have you be a part of that and they build fellowship. We even have, I think, among the ladies a birthday group. They even get together 